We are being joined by JJ French from Twisted Sister. Not only is he an accomplished musician, a rock legend, but you're also a bit of an audiophile. Is that right? Uh, well, I guess I'm about as much of an audiophile as I am a musician or anything else. It's been, I've been into this hobby, for lack of a better description of it, uh, since 1966. So I've grown up with it the same way I've grown up with rock music and you yeah. know, the Beatles and everything else. What was your first system? What was the system that got you into it? Uh, well, I was, um, I think I had a Westing, I think my parents bought me a Westinghouse stereo combo or Zenith stereo combo where you could actually unhook the speakers and move them. Oh yeah. They were on little hinges. Yeah. And I think, How old were you? Oh, 13, 14, something like that. I think it was a store on Lexington Avenue called Liberty Audio. And uh, I bought a Sony receiver and a pair of KLH6s and a ARXA turntable. That was the beginning, you know, with a, with a Shure M91 cartridge. Yeah. And that was the beginning of the stereo climb. Right. So, you know, that was fun. I mean, it was 1967. So having a Sony 6050, you know, receiver and a pair of KLH speakers and a turntable put me ahead of most people. Sure. Um, yeah, certainly most of my friends. I mean, they 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 kind of like looked at it awestruck. The first modification I did was I ripped the tone arm off of the uh, AR turntable. I mean, when I say ripped it off, I mean I just ripped it off and I bolted a. Uh, a Rabco SL8E parallel tracking arm because I read that that's how records were cut with a parallel arm, you know, with an arm that ran tangentially. Yeah. And it ran on a battery, a C cell. So I bolted it on to the turntable. <laughs> you know, that was like, and I think I changed cartridges at that point and bought a Stanton 681E. I might mean, remember all this stuff, right? Because it mattered to me. Huge thank you to today's sponsor, Ridge. More about them later. It's the holiday season and avoid giving bad gifts to your loved ones. Give them Ridge. Shop the holiday sale by going to ridge.com slash cheap audio man and get up to 30% off through December 20th. They've got a bunch of new colors, including this incredible Hyperlime. You get a Hyperlime wallet. You get a Hyperlime key case, a Hyperlime pen. I would have loved to get a Ridge wallet for a gift. This is my favorite one ever, and I've been using it every day for over a year, and it stood the test of time. Each Ridge wallet expands to hold up to 12 cards, although 12 is a little bit crazy. I'm down to four. License, debit card, credit card, library card. And I think I can even get that down to three because I don't go to the library that often. And you can get up to 30% off if you order the wallet and the key case at the same time. Over 3 million customers, over 80,000 five-star reviews. They have a 99-day risk-free policy, which means if you don't love it, you can get a refund. And it comes with a lifetime warranty, which means this gift is not just for now. It's for life. I didn't know if I was gonna love one of these little wallets when I first got it, but I did. I got off the giant wallet merry-go-round. And now it's my favorite. I stick it in my front pocket. So go over to ridge.com slash cheap audio man. If you use my link and you enter your email or your SMS text number, you can enter to win a Ridge bundle worth up to $4,000. No purchase necessary. So go to ridge.com slash cheap audio man to enter. Thank you, Ridge. Full time with the band started with Twisted Sister. I mean, I've been playing with other people and jamming, but the first real job, working job was with Twisted in 73. 73. I read that you were pretty uh, prolific when it came to live shows. Five shows a night, six nights a week. Five so, shows. So, so there'll be 30 shows a week. Yeah. So the first, the first couple of years was like, uh, if you think about that, 30 shows a week, you know, it's like 120 shows a, a month. But that's a, but that wasn't me. That was everybody. It was all the bar yeah. bands. I mean, it, that was the bar circuit. That's what you did. You did five 40-minute sets. Uh, they call it sets, but, you know, essentially we were a show band, so everything was different. We would change clothes and, and with every performance. But... 
you know, it's 40 on, 20 off, 40 on, 20 off. If you start at 9 o'clock in the evening, you play 9 to 9, 40, 10 to 10, 40, 11, 11, 40, 12, 1, 1, 40, you, you wind up at, you know, 2 o'clock in the morning. And on weekends, typically, the bar stayed open till 4 a.m., so they moved you up and started later, or they took a larger break in the middle of the night, so you finished at 3.30 in the morning. And that was standard. We didn't think it was weird. You know, we were 20 years old, and you know and you're playing cover material and you're learning how to play the more you play the better you got because you know it's kind of like um baseball baseball is 162 games a year you know if they suck one day they can come back the next day and figure out hey I, i'm not gonna do that next time that's right. what it was like unlike football or basketball football because there's only one game a week you tend to get better pretty quick because right. uh you're playing all the time and so if you screw up one night you go oh tomorrow i'm not going to screw that up there are hundreds of bands in our circuit i can't say what the circuit was like in detroit i don't know what it was like in la i don't like it was like miami or chicago it may have been the same but in the new york tri-state area it was crazy it was hundreds of clubs the dream of rock stardom i don't even know what it tangibly meant maybe a gold record i think that's really what it was gold record what is a gold record it, it, it's not just a sales number it means you become successful so i think that when i was 11 and i was watching the beatles on television and decided i want to do that i think at that moment had someone put their hand on my shoulder and said okay you know uh you were going to become a rock star okay and, uh, and i go, oh great great when and they go 20 years and six months from now i go well screw that because it was 20 years and six months before our first gold record so from the first dream at the age of 11 to the real tangible receipt of a gold record was 20 years and six months. And, I, I, and if you had told me it would take that long, I probably would say, screw that, I'm not gonna do it. But the beauty is not knowing. That, that goes around and around in circles. As much as I love the Beatles, I didn't care about playing Beatles songs, which I, I'm kind of surprised the more I think about it. As much as I revered them and the Stones, and the, I just didn't care about playing their songs. It wasn't until I heard a, a, a blues band called the Mike Butterfield, a uh, Paul Butterfield blues band, and then I heard Mike Bloomfield on guitar, who incidentally was the guitar player for Bob Dylan um, on Like a Rolling Stone and you know a lot, of, a lot of other stuff. He became a guitar. He was the American guitar hero before Clapton was the guitar hero for us. It was Mike Bloomfield. Actually, it was Danny Kalb before that in a band called the Blues Project, but. Danny Cal was the first speedmeister that we all kind of thought about. Mike Bloomfield really set the stage for the whole thing, and I became obsessed with Mike Bloomfield. So he was the first one. So he played a Fender Telecaster. I saw that on the back cover of the album, the Paul Butterfield Blues album. I saw him holding a picture of a Telecaster, and I wanted that guitar, and I went down to 48th Street, and I bought a Fender Telecaster. <laughs> Uh, Can't Stop Rock and Roll was a, was a hit in England. And we were signed in England, and we had a top 10 hit called I Am, I Me. And that was the first flush of success because uh, we wound up on all the big talk, uh, all the big TV shows, Top of the Pops, you know, it was really huge. We did the Monsters of Rock tour. I mean, uh, we toured with other bands. So in the summer of 73, or in the spring, say the, the spring, summer of 73, following the release of that album, that became a hit in England. We did a, an English tour. Then we came to America. We did an American tour. And then we went back to England and we did a European tour. Motorhead, Ozzy, Meatloaf, Whitesnake, Blue Oyster Cult, Thin Li the, the last of the, the last Thin Lizzy version before it ended, like the classic Thin Lizzy band. I, in fact, played the very last, last, last Thin Lizzy concert in Nuremberg, Germany. So that was our first taste of bigness by the time we finished the can't stop rock and roll tour in europe that tour the those festivals held up to eighty thousand people so we'd already done the, we already learned how to do that playing in front of eighty thousand, and that that's just the technique i don't mean to be blase about it but it's no different than playing in the bars you just learn how to play that's why when we did our reunion festival tour from 2003 to 2000 16 we played to anywhere from 20,000 to 110,000 people on a nightly basis you know the first one we did was completely accidental uh, it was the 
outdoor show in Long Island at a place called Adventureland. And we, at that point, were, we, were, we were playing in front of two to 4,000 people on a regular basis in bars. The, the, the day that we played that outdoor show, uh, the week prior to that, we took out advertisements. We actually had a plane flying over Jones Beach um, that said Twisted Sister Free Concert Tuesday night, Adventureland Route 110. And it was a very hot weekend, so hundreds of thousands of people saw that plane flying, you know, back and forth and back and forth and back. And forth. Also, at that point, we had independent music being played by some of the radio stations and WLIR and WBAB on Long Island. So we were getting a lot of local support. As far back as you could see in this parking lot and then standing on warehouses way in the back, you could see them standing on warehouses. And I think that was the first time I'm, I'm thinking, wow, okay, okay, great. Unfortunately, some of our overzealous fans ran over to the local airport, which I think was Republic Airport, and painted Disco Sucks on the sides of planes and got us banned from outdoor shows <laughs> for years, for years, like for 20 years. Quiet Riot broke the mold and um, had a multi-platinum record and kind of just broke through with a number one album. And um, the following year or two years, it seemed that every week a new hair band, quote, I hate that phrase, but a new heavy metal band, mostly from Los Angeles, was like breaking through the new record. And it was, I, I kind of, I described it to a friend of mine. I said, I felt like, I feel like we're on a little jet on a runway at Kennedy Airport, the, the heavy metal jet. And we were just waiting for hours to take off. The rat's uh, success of Out of the Cellar preceded us. And it was huge, 2 million selling. And, you know, that jet took off perfectly, and it was on our record label, Atlantic. So Atlantic had a lot of power in those days. So when ours hit, um, when, the minute I saw the video, I thought, that's it. This is going to be crazy. And then things became, you know, huge and, and, and remain that, you know, we toured the world. Luckily, I was 32 when it hit, not 22. If I was 22, I, I don't know what would have happened. If we were all 22, I think we would have just made some bigger mistakes. But um, we were older, and I was more into the business side of it. So I was always analyzing sales charts and demographics and stuff. I wasn't like, oh, my God, this is like, oh, you know, groupies and all that. I was married, and I had no time. I don't do drugs and drink, so therefore I'm not going to parties because mm -hmm. nobody wants me to be there, and I don't want to be there. And the record label kind of knew it. They weren't happy that we were straight. They, really? They, yeah, they thought it would hurt our reputation if the word got out that we were told not to talk about it. You know, now that doesn't mean that all these other bands are wrong. It's just everyone has a different business profile. But Gene and Paul from Kiss understood it. They were straight. They knew you can't run a business when you're wasted. It just becomes a problem. You have enough problems to deal with, let alone the problem of dealing with the with the alcohol and drug issues. And so we didn't need that. I didn't want that anyway. So most artists just do not understand. They think when you become successful that stardom is owned, and it's never owned, man. It is rented for a certain period of time until the until until your fans get sick of you, you do not own stardom. And that was apparent to me. I understood that. I understood. I never bought into anything. You're great. You suck. I don't care. You know, whatever. You know, one person, you're the best thing in the world. The other person is you're the worst thing in the world. You know, how great are, how great are you? You know, did you deliver what you needed to deliver? Did you give people their money's worth? Were you great? Will they walk away saying you're great? Um, you don't think that matters to us? Of course it does. We want to put on the best show we ever can on it every night. And we did it every night. And that's how come we had the reputation. You know, if we weren't the best band musically, we were so good performance-wise that we convinced you we were the best <laughs> band musically, whether we were or not, doesn't matter. It's performance technique. You know, the best artists know great performance techniques. And they have a responsibility to their audience, which is be great. Now, I don't agree with that with a lot of artists' versions of what they think is great. They want to reinterpret their songs. I think 90% of the audience doesn't give a damn that you want to sit there and, and reinterpret your songs because you're not in the mood to play them the way they want to hear them. And I've said that about some of the greatest artists in the world who have decided to have that attitude of, hey, man, like I'm just, you know, I'm doing this for me. And I, my attitude is, no, I'm not. I'm doing it for you. That's what I'm doing it for. I'm doing it for you. You paid hard money to come in to see me. 
doesn't matter. I played, we're not going to take it 5,000 times. You need to see it like it's done the first time. It's my job as a professional performer to do that. Well, I worked at Lyric Hi-Fi. If you were getting to Hi-Fi in the early 80s, when the golden age of, of stereo was really happening and uh, defined by the absolute sound in Stereophile magazine and, and basically was the um, base camp for what is now high-end. So in 82, 83, 82, 83, I started to really become aware of hi-fi equipment. You know, up until this point, I had gone through stereos, Citation amplifiers, 11, Citation 11 and 12, and I had phase linear 400s, and I had SAE preamps, and, and I had gone through about 10 different speakers, and my turntables, you know, had gone from the AR to a, a Garage Zero 100 to a Dual 1019 to an ELAC or something. I, I don't remember, Empire 598. I mean, they all started crawling up little bits, but by 1982, I had some real disposable income. So I went to another store called Sound by Singer, and uh, they treated me well. I bought myself my kind of first next level stereo. I became infested with the idea of high-end audio and being better and better and better and better. And, and as the band became more popular and I traveled around the world, I was able to be in countries with that sold the stereo gear that I could buy directly from them and have it shipped back to the United States. So when I was in England, I bought B&W speakers because they're manufactured in England. When I was in Japan, I bought a Nakamichi Dragon cassette deck because I was in Japan. I bought a Koetsu cartridge at the Akihabara because I was in Tokyo. I bought Pro Amplification New Zealand because I was in New Zealand. I was buying and selling and playing in the band and, and changing equipment all the time and reading the magazines and every magazine the next month was the next great piece because there used to be this piece, but now yeah. it's that piece or now it's the improved version. It's series two. Then it's the reference that you get sucked into the vortex of the high end audio and upgrades, 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 upgrades. And this kept going and going. And I went through a couple of divorces and every time I went through a divorce, I sold all the gear. You know, I bought the equipment again. I went through a divorce. I sold all <laughs> I'd become friends with the guys at Lyric. 1995, the band had stopped playing in, in 89. And one day the owner of, of Lyric said, God, you know, you hang out here all the time. What are you doing these days? I said, nothing much. He goes, well, you know all this gear. You want, you, you want to sell it. It's rough your job as a salesman. I said, well, if I become a salesman, well, will you introduce me to all the companies? That really became my whole motivation here was to, to meet the owners or the reps. So he said, yeah, you buy all this stuff at 50 off. Or, or better. So I started working at Lyric. But meanwhile, I got to buy more stuff. And the company started giving me stuff because I'm a salesman at Lyric. They want me to have the stuff because they want me to sell the stuff. They want me to know the stuff. And so my dreams started coming true. And more stuff starts coming. And I'm buying it either. I'm getting it for free or 20 cents on the dollar or closeouts or whatever. So that was it. you know. And that, that went on for five, six years. you know. And so and then in the context of all that, I understood the politics of uh, absolute sound and stereophile because all those writers would come into Lyric and you got to know the whole politics, the political connection. You know, I mean, why is a car reviewed, a car and driver at this level? Because they advertise at that level. The cynicism that goes with, the, with everything else, you have to cut through the crap, the cynicism and all that shit to what's really good. And, you know, privately they'll say, well, this company doesn't advertise a lot, but this is a really good company. You know, they'll tell you that. And you, yeah. you know, you want really good stuff at less prices you can buy that because they they know the truth so the politics became overarching and ridiculous and absolutely not a shock like after i started putting two two and two together like why is it that every time um there was an item for sale and absolute sound and it was there was a new piece on on the cover why did lyric have that at the store well because the publisher of absolute sound the owner of lyric were buddies Make sure he had it in stock. You know, it's that kind of crap, right? Doesn't mean they're selling bad stuff. It just means that what you. It just means the truth is colored by politics. And uh, and you can say that about everything. But there's a lot of good product out there. It's a lot of really good product. And so I started to know all these companies and all this product, and I got to know it really well. And I got to know the history of it really well. As I asked a lot of questions, and um, that continued on. So after I left Lyric, I still maintained all my relationships. Why do I write for this stuff? You know, how did that happen? So Paul McGowan's a friend of mine at PS Audio, and at a show uh, when Bill Liebens was running. Um, Copper, he said, would you write for Copper? And I said, well, I got a lot of music opinions. I like to write, you know, album reviews and concert reviews. And he said, be my guest, do whatever you want. 
so they gave me like an open book and then gold mines said well you know we want you to write for us and what do you know i said well i know beatles as well as i know high-end audio as well as i know guitars i could write volumes on the beatles so i became a writer for goldman when my book was coming out i started writing for ink magazine business columns for ink know a lot about audio i know a lot about the beatles i know a lot about guitars and you know politics uh, i mean politics i'm getting into that this this week on my podcast i have a very controversial podcast this week i i have a rather open-ended podcast which is you give me your opinions like i want to hear what you have to say i'm giving yeah. you a, i'm giving you a platform i have actors and producers and singers and D's been on, Robert Halford's been on, Joe Bonamassa has been on, Steve Vai's been on. Um, I've had uh, I've had an extraordinary collection of people on my podcast of people that are talking to me. That's fun. So all of it's fun. You know, all of it is 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 fun. But Mark Mendoza, who told me about you and 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 listens to you all the time. So when we ran in the hallway and you said, "Hey, let's do this," I was like, "Sure." I didn't exactly know what cheap high fine man would be, but I will say this. I am a complete proponent in finding great sounding stuff for low prices. Well, thank you very much. I'd like to remind people that I do have a podcast, the JJ French Connection on Spotify. It's J-Y-J-Y-F-R-E-N-C-H Connection on Spot Beyond the Music on Spotify and Apple. And I also, uh, you can email me directly at AskJJTS. That's AskJJJYJYTS, like Taylor Swift. Twisted Sister Times Square. Ask JJTS at Gmail. You can email me directly. I'm also on Cameo if you want anything personally addressed to you or a family member or a friend for a birthday. I have my book out called Twisted Business, which you can get on Amazon. You see the cover back there with my co-writer Steve Farber. It's a business book, and uh, you should uh, get a hold of that. And I write for Copper. And I write for Goldmine. And, um, I, and, and Michael Fremer just hired me. For, uh, for tracking angle for his, uh, he hired me at the show, as a matter of fact. So I, in fact, I'm writing, I'm in the middle of writing my first review for Michael Fremer's tracking angle. So, and Michael Fremer's a great friend. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. I, I could talk high five all, all day long. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you. Well, it's been a pleasure. Thanks, AJ.